Hello, and welcome to another episode of LGOTV Big Talk. And why big talk? Because I hate small talk. So my guest today is a dear friend of mine, Vin Jiang, and he he's a talker like me. He's a professional speaker, but he's not just a professional speaker. He's a magician. He's a communications coach. He is really one of the most fascinating humans I have met on the speaking circuit. The speaking circuit is a cool place because you get to meet the most incredible people in the green room and at dinners and at conferences. And from the first time I met Vin, I saw that he had this incredible tattoo on his arm. And I said, Vin, I got to hear about this tattoo. So Vin, let's start there because I think this tattoo is such a great way to just give your story and who you are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How, how revealing. I love it. So this is the tattoo and the tattoo is uh, wrong way. But it's it's a it's a it's a boat that's sinking, which represents mom and dad's journey when they when they fled Vietnam. And then there's an oil rig, and then there's the helicopters that kind of represent the war. So the story behind it was, mom and dad escaped the war, and my dad wasn't a fisherman, but became a fisherman to learn the patrol route of the Viet Cong. And then once he learned the patrol route, he realized there was one day they never kind of patrolled, and that was the stormiest evenings. So on that night, that's the night they escaped. And after all the adversity through the ocean, they ran out of petrol, ran out of fuel. And then they were actually saved by an oil rig. So my family was actually saved by a New Zealander captain on an oil rig. And to me, I got that tattoo because I, I just, I never want to forget that I'm the son of a refugee family, that that is a part of my identity. That's who I am. Because for a long time, I grew up, I, I had an identity crisis. And, you know, you saw me with the blonde hair and everything. It's like, I kept asking myself, like, who am I? Where is home? And and I had a big identity crisis. So to me, this is just a part of my identity. And I remember showing my mom and going, look, mom, look what I've done. And her first words were, can't you just remember with your head? And I was like, <laughs> no, I, I want to remember on my arm. So there you go. <laughs> So that's an interesting question. Where is home? Because right now, yeah. I mean, because you're, you're, you're from Vietnam, uh, but I met you, you were living in LA and now you're in Australia. Yeah. I mean, mom and dad were born and raised in Vietnam. I was lucky. I avoided all of that. So I was born in Australia and then I was in Australia for 30 years of my life. Then I lived in America for about four years and now I'm back in Australia again. But yeah, I, I remember asking my dad, I said, dad, where, like, who am I? Uh, is Vietnam my home or is Australia my home? And, and my dad always said to me, Australia uh, is my home. Uh, you know, is that, my, my dad, yeah. Is that because he, it, it was for him because that's he, because he escaped it or was he, he just wanted yeah. to put that behind him? It's such an interesting thing. Like that generation puts things behind them and then just, just only looked forward. As much as he says he puts it behind him, I still know that he feels uh, he, he still believes Vietnam is home, but there's that part of his heart where it's like, oh, my own country betrayed my people and, you know, attacked their own people and everything. So so there's a lot of pain there. And there was a period where I, I wanted to call Vietnam home. And he goes, no, no, it's not your home. You, Australia is your home. And it, so, yeah. And, and then I lived in America. So, so to me, I... I don't know, like it, it, the world is our home, I guess. I mean, I feel like America was home for me. That's why when I saw America going through all these tough times, I felt a lot for America. That was my home for four years. So it's, yeah, I don't know. I feel like a bit of a global citizen right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the, probably the world would be a lot better if all of us were more global citizens than, than, than we are. Uh, although maybe it'd be better if we were all like citizens of our home. <laughs> right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, here we are recording this right before Thanksgiving 2020. So I'm very interested in how you became a magician, especially given that, you know, this sort of identity crisis and who are you and magic is all about sort of pretending. Yeah. How did you, when did you yeah. first start? How did you get introduced to, to magic in the first place? Because I wanted a girlfriend. That's why I did it. I, I, I grew up lacking attention to the max and especially from girls. And, and I just really wanted to in a way find love so i remember the first time i did a magic trick uh, it was given by a librarian because a librarian would i used to go to libraries every day after school because my parents would just drop us off because they realized they could get an extra three hours of work in if they dropped us off at the state library because libraries would open till 6 p.m so we were always at libraries and then one day this librarian saw us playing with cards all the all the time so she gave us gave us a magic book and 
that was my first magic book ever. And then when I performed the trick from it, everyone at school was like, wow, you're amazing. I was like, wow, no one's ever said this to me before. And hence I became fully addicted to it because I was addicted to the attention. Yes. And that's why I got into it because the addiction to the attention, which then brought confidence, but then it actually became a problem for me later because I couldn't talk to you without a packet of cards. It was, if I left my packet of cards at home, I left my confidence at home. I left my personality at home. I left everything at home. So it became a problem. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So was it, it was like, it, it, because it was like the barrier, right? It was like, it was like the, the, the identity you put on in front of somebody else. Like I, I, I'm not Vin, I'm Vin the magician. Yeah, it, it, was, it was that and also contextual confidence. I was contextually confident when I had my packet of cards. I mean, gosh, even until today, you know, I'm a, I'm a grown man in my mid thirties and I, I have a packet of cards within arm's reach at all times. It's just, it, it's weird. It's contextually confident. It's like one of my friends who's a guitarist, the shyest human being you ever meet. But if you catch him with a guitar, he's probably one of the most confident James Bond-esque people you ever meet, right? And he's only like that with the guitar, though. So it's interesting how contextual confidence uh, comes into play. Oh, that's so fascinating. My uh, my husband plays guitar, and he's a you know generally quiet, relatively quiet guy. And we rented at a mm. bar for his fortieth birthday. And my parents, you know, we threw this big party. My 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 family came up. My parents were there. And John, my husband, played along with his band. Uh, you know, a bunch of like wow. you know dad band. And he you know they played the whole night. And I think it was John's dream because he could be in a room with all the people he loved. Mm playing music, doing the stuff that he loved, but he didn't have to make small talk with anybody. It was like his dream come <laughs> true. And Good at on one you, point, John. Right, at one point he like belts out a song and my mom turns to me and she's like, and we'd been married for like 20 years at this point. And my mom's like, I didn't know he could make that much noise. <laughs> wow. But you see, that's again an example of contextual confidence, right? It's, it's, it's so powerful and, and that, that, that's why, in, in, because like you mentioned in the beginning, I teach communication and, and I tell a lot of students that that's why you need to work on your voice because your voice is an instrument you carry everywhere you go in your life. And the moment I started working my voice as opposed to just a packet of cards, it changed the way I felt confidence wise because now I felt like I had a packet of cards everywhere I went. I felt like I had that guitar no matter where I went because you can't accidentally leave your voice at home unless you lose your voice, for example. But it's, it's, it's just interesting. Like I, yeah, it became a severe problem for me for, for many, many years. I had to learn how to detach from it. So uh, I'm sure your parents wanted you to detach from it pretty early also, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean they're, 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 they're escaping, you know, war-torn country. They're, they're, they're saved by the oil rig. They find themselves, uh, you know, yeah. in, in Australia. They have this beautiful baby boy, and he's like, oh, and by the way, I'm going to drop out of college and do magic. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Because mom and dad went through so much adversity, Laura, they they clung to security. Uh, mm -hmm. They they didn't think about passion or doing what you love or you know doing what makes your heart race or time melts away. To them, it's security over everything, and they were blinded by love. And as a result, they kind of forced you know my generation of Asian parents. They kind of forced their children into kind of doctors, accountants, and lawyers because it's secure. Mm -hmm. because it's extremely secure. So for me, it took someone else to show my parents something in me. Uh, I tell my story on stage, but it's a short version. I don't get to tell the full version. So I did work experience in an accounting firm and my dad arranged it because he had connections and I was going to gradually go into that accounting firm. And every day after work experience there, I would perform magic for you know the marketing department, accounting, obviously, and, and admins. And I'd love it. I'd stay to like 6 p.m. after work. And then one day, one of the partners, he saw me performing. And I remember him, he always had his left hand in his pocket. And I was like, why, why doesn't he take it out? It was, it was really frustrating for me. And one day, he finally comes up to me and he goes, uh, come into my office. I, I want to see you. And I was like, oh, shit, this is where I get fired. Yeah. Uh, so then I, uh -oh. I, I go in. Oh, my dad's going to kick my ass. So then I, I go in and he says to me something I didn't expect. He goes, uh, in six months' time, two things will happen. Uh, either you will leave voluntarily, or I'm going to fire you anyway. I was like, why? Shit, my dad's going to kill me. He, my, my dad worked so hard to get me this. And he goes, just, just hear me out. And he pulls out his left hand, probably for the first time I've ever seen it. He was a man in his mid seventies. He had really bad arthritis. And 
he said, Vin, I, I love piano. Uh, I, I played at a very young age. It was the greatest gift my parents gave me by giving me piano lessons. I gave it up at the age of 25 to build this. Uh, I, I, I regret it every day I walk in here since mm. I turned about 45. You have a gift. You're in the wrong career. I could have played with orchestras all around the world, uh, and I gave it up. I regret it every single day. And I remember looking at him. We paused for this really intense moment, and I said, can you come home with me and tell my dad the exact same thing you just said? That was brilliant. <laughs> and, and he did. And he did. So he actually came home, had dinner with my family, and he showed a side of me that my parents were afraid to see. My parents were afraid that I'd have a talent outside of the secure frame that they had created. And it took someone who was successful in their eyes, you know, this man who drove like a $250,000 Mercedes in the driveway, like to them success, right? For, for that man to say that about me, only then did it open their eyes. Whereas before that, I knew they could see that I was good at magic because I know I did magic and my dad, I could see him, I could see his eyes go, holy shit. But his face was like, no, <laughs> doctor. Yeah. It's a hobby. And right. Yeah. And, and they could see my talent, but they wouldn't acknowledge it. And they only acknowledge it after somebody else acknowledged it who they thought was successful, which was, which was fascinating, that kind of psychology. But again, I, I talk to them more now and I realize that's because of extreme adversity has forced them to cling on to the only thing they knew how to cling on to and all security. Yes, yes. And so you go into this career in magic and, you know, before we started recording, we talked about this idea of wonder hell, right? Where it's like, mm. it's incredible and it's wonderful and you're finding success. And also it's really scary. So it's this moment mm. where you're like, I know, I see the potential. I know that I could do more. Am I willing to go there, right? Am I, am I willing to step into that? Am I going to let myself believe that it's possible? And I have to imagine that if you're somebody who does magic, you have to believe that mm. things are possible, even if you don't see proof of them anyway. So did that affect your ability to believe in yourself? Or do, do you still struggle from the same stuff everyone else does about, you know, not, you know, not knowing if it's going to work out? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's so easy, especially for us as speakers, for people to have this kind of grandiose kind of, wow, look at this person. But it's like, man, I fart. I burp. I'm the same as you. We're not, you know, we're still human. So I, I think absolutely. I, I still feel all of it. And, and I love the concept of Wonder Hell, Laura. It's so freaking awesome. I, I felt that with magic for sure, because I remember getting my first gig and I was paid, I think it was like $250 for an hour. And I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. You know, my, my friends who are pharmacists get paid $30 an hour, you know, as a pharmacist, I'm getting paid 250. This is crazy. And it was like the cusp of going, wow, something amazing is happening. Mm -hmm. But I got that gig purely because of luck. It was right place, right time, luck. And then after that, there were no, there were no gigs after that. I was like, what is happening? So it was wonder and then it was hell. Because now that I've seen that world, like you so eloquently said, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So it opened my eyes for a brief moment. And now I couldn't unsee it. I couldn't do anything else. I, I, I can't go back to, I, I used to work in a petrol station, a, a gas station. I think I keep calling it petrol. That's what we call it in Australia. But I, I, I worked in a petrol station and I couldn't do that anymore where I was slaving away for 10, 12 hours a day at like 14 bucks an hour. I, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. So it creates wonder, which was brilliant, but it was hell now because I can't unsee the wonder. So I was stuck in this kind of purgatory and it was shit. Yeah, it was really shit. Uh, it, I think a lot of the times people paint it to be so exciting, exhilarating. For me, it was, it was, it was atrocious because it, I, yeah, I, I was just in a state of, you know, it was that luck. Was that just me right place right time can i ever do that again and it was a year before i got my next gig again and actually learned how to play the magician game professionally so yeah i went through a year of wonder hell if you would 
Yeah, it's really hard, to, you know, when you think about it, like if you combine that with what I would imagine would be a a, a, a mindset that you were taught growing up, you know, like um, discipline, uh, you know, so that you can avoid scarcity and, and you know, all of the sort of like the, the, the typical immigrant, you know, mindset that, you know, I had, you know, my grandparents, right? Like we all have had that, it's, you know, at some point in, in our lives, but it's, it imprints on you, I think. And so if you sort of, you yeah. take that and then you, you have this like, look, I, 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 I see like 250, I could do it again. I could do it again. And you just, it's like, how do you recreate luck? You know, that's really so challenging because, you know, I've, I've had so many people call me um, and, and say, you know, Limitless was so successful. Tell me what you did with your book launch. And I'm like, why don't I tell you what I'm going to do for my next book launch that I've learned from my first one? Because I worked my ass off for Limitless, but I got really lucky. And it's like, I can't teach you how to recreate the luck parts of it, but I could teach you how to groove the patterns of the mm. things that I did that worked and also how not to make the mistakes I made for the things that didn't work. It's yeah, well, really I mean, hard. It is. Uh, I mean, the, the the kind of general definition of luck that people use is preparation. It's where preparation meets opportunity, right? So, you know, the, the patterns you speak of is, well, what what is the preparation that will lead you towards being ready for the opportunities at hand? And the classic example of this, uh, you know, we're going through right now in the speaking industry, right? I, I was preparing virtually. I, I think I was early in the game mm -hmm. so I, I prepared i prepared everything virtually i was ready to go yes and then there were no opportunities <laughs> yes i remember you had like kitted out your whole garage you like yeah. you had changed yeah. everything in california and we were all watching like oh that's a good idea that's a good idea i'm gonna do that and then it was like crickets. That's, it was like crickets and and to me that's the price you have to pay for being an early mover right for mm -hmm. being an, uh, an early adopter and that's okay. I was panicking after it went quiet because I was like, oh man, this is crap. Like I, I misread the market. I, I've gone the wrong way. And then again, wonder hell, right? Because I was early and I got that really quick first booking and I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is, you know, happy days. I, I've, I've saved myself and maybe even saved the industry. Look at me. I'm amazing. And then nothing. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's, that's why I love this concept of wonder hell. This is going to be such a brilliant book, Laura. This is amazing. But that's what happened because one to hell again, it's got the one booking and then nothing. And then you go through that hell process. But I, I kind of recognized it. I went, I know what this is. I, I've been through this before because I've been through it with magic. I've been through it with the speaking and now I'm going through it again with the virtual world. So to me, instead of treating it as hell, I, I looked at it as a process of training. We'll keep iterating, keep getting better. Even if there are no customers, that's okay. Keep preparing. So I just kept preparing. I just kept going iteration. I created my own opportunities and I kept preparing. And yeah, I think the market now is ripe, you know, and, and again, lucky. I, I do feel lucky, but again, I think it's from the preparation. Yeah, that, so that brings us back to the same idea, right? Of, um, of belief, right? Of just knowing, of believing it's going to be there, that the market's going to catch up at some point. And, you know, there are moments yeah. where I, I, I look back and I, you know, I like, I find especially during coronavirus, I feel like I'll, I'll have this sort of moment of, I don't like the best times I write are when I'm like super emotional or super angry or maybe a little drunk and there's no really? governor and it just all comes out. And those are the, those are wow. the posts that, you know, get tons of, you know, likes and loves and comments and they go viral. And then literally mm. I'll see like, a month later, someone else with like a big brand name will write the same thing. And then it's all over the place in the zeitgeist. And I'm like, should I just hold my powder for three to four months every time I write something? You know, it's this like early mover thing. Like you just, but then I think you have to just keep, you have to keep going and iterating and innovating mm. and getting better at the thing that you do. But it does take that belief, that belief that like you can't see it, but it's, it's going to be there. Yeah, it's. And it's hard to believe it when you don't see it. It really is. That's a really interesting point. How do you how do you go through that when there's when there's no when there's no evidence of anything? How do you gain the belief to be able to keep moving? I don't think I can articulate that. That's I I, I do it, but I don't know how to articulate it. <laughs> well, I mean, look, you're a magician, and I grew up in politics, so like we both believe in things that don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so eloquently put. I like it. I mean, I you know, I think it's just uh, there. There is a part of me that's this like undying optimism, this idealism, this like it's it's think like I do think that if you work hard enough, eventually things go your way. Like I think you know what you say, luck is when opportunity, mm. well, luck is when hard work meets opportunity, right? But like mm. if you're not doing the hard work, when the opportunity comes along, you may be able to like fake your way through it the first time, but you can't stick yeah. with it. You're not going to actually be able to perform. And you know our our clients really to de they demand our best. Like, you know, don't you have yeah. people who come up to you after a gig who are like, I heard you speak and I decided to do X. Like they change, they yeah. do something, yeah. they quit a job, they leave a marriage, they start a business, they, they, they take a chance and they do it because we say something that moves them. And I feel like if you don't get it right, like that's kind of, mm. kind of shitty, right? Like it's, it's your responsibility to get it right. So I do think that the hard work, the reps, right? They, they pay off. Like I, I was going live every day on Facebook, you know, every day, just like, does this light work? Does this camera work? Can you hear me? How's the sound? And I was only doing, cause I wanted to figure out all my stuff. Cause you know, I didn't, I don't have a background like you, so I didn't have this great, this great studio. And then I ended up um, getting a gig, like, I don't know, six weeks ago. And it was, like the 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 bureau was blown away because they were like that was incredible you were so professional your setup everything this that and the other mm. and i i was texting with a mutual friend of ours and he was like that's because you did all those reps like back then when yeah. nobody was looking when no one knew it was like you set up everything so early and now that mm. the market's caught up you're so far yeah. ahead of it even though they're first yep. like oh yeah we could do these gigs in this virtual world the way that vin's doing them you know and, and that's I think that's how most of the top performers become top performers is they were preparing when everyone else was sleeping. Yeah. And it, it's, it's always, especially, you know, like the doomsday preppers, they must have been laughing when the virus came about. They're like, finally. They, they would have felt, it, it, yeah, yeah. They would have just felt like we can live off this for five years. You know, some of them are probably still in bunkers right now, but it's, I think that's what's, Again, how how long before are you willing to prepare? Yeah, you know, and and and, and I think the earlier you prepare, the, the greater the risk because you could be wrong. So I think there's there's a bit of that sensitivity you have to build. You know, there were people preparing for virtual five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. I'm sure. You know, and and if you prepare too far out, you won't have a long enough runway to survive until you become lucky. So I think the skill is even if it is a skill because it's probably all luck and I'm making this up anyway. But I think there is a slight skill as to when to start the preparation process, when to start putting in the reps. And as an entrepreneur, I've built sensitivity to that, you know, and, and even for me, I once I built the studio, I spent a bunch of money, thank goodness for return policies. But but to me, it's that sensitivity of, of when to go all in. Uh, I, yeah. It's a yeah, hard one I, to, to be able to. I think that yeah. is such a challenge. Like, you know, I, I talk a lot about these side quests, you know, like you can't, if, if you're not ready to do the main quest, like get on your horse, go to the castle, slay the dragon, save the princess. There are side <laughs> quests that you can do, right? Like you're a farmer. So, mm, you know, you, like you, that. you, you go to market and you, you bring your wheat and you sell it and you get potions and a horse and a sword. And then when you're ready to finally go, you can get on your horse and go to the castle and slay the dragon and save the princess. But I, I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, they they struggle with the like, it's all or none. I quit my job, I start doing the thing. And I think there are mm. so many side quests we can do. Like you're like what you were saying about how do you time it? I think you you mm. you have to like start doing all the side quests until you're just, you can't not do the thing you want to do either because you're so passionate about that you have to do it or because the market's finally responding. When I started my last business, I, I, I give a lot of talks in, in you know to groups of entrepreneurs and there's always someone who's like, how long did it take you to write your business plan? And I'm always like, I didn't have any mm. plan. I had a business, but I had no plan. So at a certain yeah. point, you just have to leap because there's enough yeah. pressure enough weight um bring you forward so one of the things that you've been doing like you built this whole virtual world and you've been doing the virtual speaking but you've also started teaching communication skills and and i have to say you know I saw you speak at uh, the NSA conference a couple of years ago in Denver, and I was sitting right next to, I was actually sitting in between Scott Stratton and, uh, and Carrie Lorenz, you know, good, good friends of ours. And Carrie was I about tried. to go 
to the main stage uh, to give a talk in front of the entire conference. And halfway through your talk, she turns to me and she's like, can I get Ebola in the next five minutes so that I don't have to follow Vin? He's too good. <laughs> and we were watching you and we were like, how is he? Like, it wasn't just that you were doing magic. You were magical in the way that you were using your your voice and the way that you're using this instrument. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how the the journey went from speaking to I can actually teach people the things that I'm doing on stage. Yeah, and thank you for the kind words. Every time people compliment me, I, I yeah, it just makes me want to vomit. But thank you. That was really, really nice. I, I still don't understand how to 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 accept compliments, especially when MCs do it, because they just list all your credibility, like achievements. You're like, oh, I want to die. Yeah, you're like, who is well, that douchebag? I don't want yeah, to. Who is, who is, yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's why I try amazing. to shove it in a whole long question. I try to like stick it in the middle and then keep going. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really good. It's very tactical. I like it. Well, <laughs> Look, look, for me, it's the, the reason I started teaching communication is simply because I think we all tend to teach the things that helped us transform and helped us become who we are. And I used to be invisible, uh, hence why, you know, hence why you knew me in my platinum blonde days. But to me, I used to be invisible growing up. Again, it just goes back to that. I was invisible and I was invisible because I didn't know how to communicate effectively. In my culture, it was just just shut up and do the work, and don't don't cause a ruckus. Just just don't stir things up at work. Don't stir things up at school. Just, just shut up, do the work, get your A's, and come home. Like you know, just we weren't taught to voice our feelings, and we also grow up in a culture that is not very expressive. You know, mum and dad didn't tell me they loved me up until I was twenty nine. You know, they didn't tell me they were proud of me up until I was, you know, 29. And that was because I was asking for it. I was like, are you even proud of me? And it was, yeah, of course we are. But just, why didn't you ever tell me? And again, it's because this culture of, it's so bound by respect and it's not one that values communication. Right. They were like, we fed and you, as a we housed you. That's how we express our love. That's, that's love. Yeah. Like, yeah, my mom, to her, I love you is have you eaten yet? You know, and, and that's how they communicate. And I was like, but I don't understand that language. You should tell me. And growing up being invisible, growing up in a family that didn't communicate much, the moment I learned to communicate, the moment I connected with my parents and got them to communicate, the level of happiness and fulfillment in my life significantly changed. And then the moment I learned how to communicate more effectively and I got on stages and was able to inspire people, I just thought to myself, holy shit, this is amazing. And then even as a magician, the moment I communicated, like I learned to communicate better, my life flourished. Even in my love life, it changed. So then I just went, I need to teach this. I, I don't wanna just do the one hour on stage anymore because after a while for me, the one hour on stage, I started to feel like, ah, oh, that's kind of momentary motivation that I provide. Uh, if, if you spend three days with me, I can help transform you. Uh, in an hour, I can be the spark that could ignite a fire. But if you come and spend three days, I can pour petrol on you and we can create something magnificent. So to me, I, I, want, I was starving impact. And the workshop kind of was that for me when we were able to do them live. Uh, <laughs> not anymore. Yeah. Are, are you doing them virtually now? Yes. Yeah. So I had to go through a process where I had to turn my three-day live workshop into a virtual experience. And, and man, that was hard because... Yeah, if you try to recreate, I think I think one of our friends, Brian Franzo, says this too. Like, don't recreate the live experience. Don't repurpose it. You know, create something, redesign something completely new. Yes. So that that was really hard. What kinds of people sign up for these uh, for these uh, these retreats? It's really strange. All different people from all walks of life. But if I had to kind of try to give a sense of my audience, it's people who are very technical. People who are very technical and often because of their technical brilliance, they've, they've, they've doubled down on that and just went, you know what, I'll let my work speak for me. And now have become extremely frustrated because they go, damn it, my work doesn't speak for me as well as I can speak for me. So people who are technically brilliant who will come along and, and want to improve the way they communicate. And it's amazing when they do. It's amazing when they do. Because I, I kind of realize what I am and, and who I am. And I, I'm I'm very good at I'm very good at the showmanship side. So if you would, I'm just 
I just tell my students, I'm just an empty human being who's just a showman uh, with no substance, whereas all of you have the substance. And if I can teach you the showmanship, you are the people who can tra change the world because you have the ability to, the technical ability to, and the technical know-how. Whereas, <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just a shell. <laughs> yeah. Not so. quite sure I would buy that. But... <laughs> yeah, thank you for not buying that. Because if you did, and then I, I just, I just go away and just rock in the corner. <laughs> so, like, I mean, what, like, are there, is there like low hanging fruit that people come and you're just like, okay, let's like, let's get rid of all the like, these are the, these are the mistakes that yeah. everybody makes, or is it, it's, is everyone their own, their own problem? Well, I look at it as your voice is an instrument and come along and learn the foundations on how to play this instrument. And then you can choose what genre you'd like to play. You can choose what kind of songs you'd like to write. Mm. However, first, let's learn how to play this instrument and learn how to play it well. Learn how to play it in a, well, in, in a way that will move people, uh, in a way that is more influential. And it, it, it's amazing because most people don't view it as an instrument. They just go, oh, it's, it's just... It, you know, words are the only mode they, they look at words as the main modality for communication. And I go, look, words are extremely important. However, how you say something is, is just as important. They're both. Wh why do we have to choose one or the other? I mean, I, I always hear my clients say this. They go, oh, then which one should we focus on? You know, what we're saying or how we're saying it? And I go, both. <laughs> it's both just as important. You know, it's like riding a bike only using one pedal. What are you doing? Use both. Yeah. So when, when uh, I think that um, I think communications are, are are super interesting, and it and I love that you've switched to this virtual training now because you know the world is virtual now, so people have to learn how to communicate mm. in this kind of super weird way. And I, I'm I'm. I think um, that the introverts like me have really uh, have really benefited from this pandemic in a lot of ways, right? I mean, I'm like an introverted workaholic, so in some ways, I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> like, I'm like, really happy, um, and and it's and it's fascinating because I like I hate talking on the phone. I hate it. Like my voicemail on my phone even says, um, thank you for calling. Please don't leave me a voicemail. I'd like to say I'm going to listen to it, but I won't. Like I just, the disconnected oh, voice without, and I'm saying this, of course, people are listening to, you know, as a, as a podcast and like, you know, I recognize the irony, but having to engage with somebody when I can't see their facial expressions is so right. hard for me. So the fact that we're all separate, but now every phone call mm. I used to have is now a Zoom. Most people hate mm. that, but I actually love it because I can see people's faces and I it's I, I don't mm. mind the Zoom call. I hate the phone call. So I'm I'm yeah. how I, I mean it's the sort of how you say it and what you say. And then it's like body language and facial expressions and all of yeah. that. And people who you who you are training who have a ton of technical knowledge, do you find that they've got some of these like social awkward things that I have where they're like, I don't know how to make eye contact. It's freaking me out. Yeah. Uh, no, I get that. And I get introverts and extroverts, right? And this question always comes up in my class and I love it because I'm like, yes, I love it because I've got a really good answer and it makes me look smart. Bring it. But it's, it's the, yeah, they go, bring it on. And then they say, yeah, is there, is, there a, is there a difference between how extroverts and introverts should communicate? And, and to me, I asked them a question back and I asked them, is there a difference between how an introvert and an extrovert would play a piano? Is there a difference in the foundations of how one would play the instrument, the piano? And I go, no. And I go, well, the same goes for an introvert and an extrovert when they communicate. Like if, if, you, if you ask most people, and if they watch this, 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 this kind of live stream of ours, and if you ask them, is Laura a, an introvert or an extrovert? That, that'd probably peg you as an extrovert. Oh, people right? are because, stunned, stunned when I say that. Well, they, I was shocked. I was like, yeah. no, nonsense. This is not real. Uh -huh. But it's because you, you've learned how to play your instrument. Yeah. And there's no difference. We, we've got to stop trying to put things in boxes all the time because mm -hmm. life is way more complicated than that. So, so to me, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you still need to learn the foundational ways of how to communicate. You can't just go, oh, because I'm an introvert, or because I'm an extrovert, I can do this. No. I think I use the analogy, a piano has 88 keys, right? And for us to be authentic in the way we communicate, we need to learn how to use all 88 keys. Hmm. The most inauthentic thing you can do is only use these 12 keys over here. But the problem is 
people get attached to their voices and they go, oh, but but then, you know, if, if you get me to do this really high and, you know, maybe even do that with my voice, then that's inauthentic. That's not, it's fake and phony. And I go to them, no, it's not fake and phony. If you can make the sound, it's real. It's not fake. The only problem that's happened in your mind is you've become extremely familiar with these keys. These keys over here you think are fake and phony, but in fact, they're not fake and phony. They're just unfamiliar. And, and when you teach people who are fairly technically minded, when you teach them how to use the entire instrument, all of a sudden now, their ideas, their visions, their strategies come to life. Whereas yeah. before, people like myself would come in and have no technical ability, come in and, and, and share an idea, and it's frankly quite a crappy idea, would win people over, as opposed to the people who have way better ideas, and it's simply because, and I use, I'm sorry, I'm using so many analogies, but if I take the greatest piece of music written by Beethoven and, and I, play it, I play it poorly, will you perceive it to be great music? No. Right. Or again, so, so, so how you share your vision, how you share your strategy or how you share your brilliance matters. That rings so yeah. true to me. You know, when I, when in my last company, I would, I sold executive search. I ran an executive search firm and I would walk in and I'd sit down at my client's offices and I, and, 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 and I, I did one thing really wrong and one thing really right. So the wrong thing I did is I would go in and I would talk all about how we have this new way to do executive search and aren't we more clever than anyone else you've ever talked to? And isn't it great because we're going to charge you differently and we're going to do the work differently. And that was not a good idea because I would leave and we were by far the best firm and I wouldn't get the search. And finally, hmm. one day I had a conversation with a friend of mine who happened to be on the search committee, the deciding committee that we didn't get the search. And I called him up and I'm like, you know what, Darren, what gives? And he was like, do you bring in excellent candidates? And I was like, of course we do. We're a search firm. That's table stakes. And he's like, yeah, but you never said it. Every other search firm oh, started with the fact wow. that they brought in excellent candidates and then they told us how. You just jumped to the house. So you didn't talk about us. You were not communicating mm. about us. So that was the mistake I made. But then once I figured that out, I would start, I'd walk and I'd be like, we're going to find you the best candidates ever because you deserve no less because you, mm. you know, this is what you guys do and here's why your work is important and we're going to find you great people. And I was so excited about their work mm. that time after time after time, our potential customers would say, God, you seem like you love what you do. And I was like, yeah, I do. I've got the greatest job ever and I can't wait to do it for you. And then we would get the work. And so what you're saying really rings true to me because I was so over indexing on how clever our business model was that I forgot right. to talk about them and to show my passion about who they were. Yeah. And once I let my freak flag fly and I was just unfettered about like why freak I loved flag. their stuff. I mean, they, <laughs> they, 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 like, they couldn't get enough. It was like the greatest thing ever because suddenly they're like, we hired you because we thought you understood our problem and our problem would be your problem until our collective problem went away. And I was like, yes, but that took mm -hmm. really not being, cause I was, you know, I started this firm when I was 31 years old. I was a young mom. I didn't, I was like, I, I called ourselves a group because it was me and my six week old and my Dalmatian. And I was like, I don't want them to know it's just me and my attic. Right. Like I wanted them to think it's like this really <laughs> impressive, you know, professional services firm. But it, but and I, so I wanted to like be super professional, and it turns out like being somebody I wasn't and playing the Beethoven badly was just bad music. Yeah, well, and and that's again, it just speaks to and and well, here's the thing: we don't get taught this, right? You know, do, do they teach us this in school? We, we the whole year you get one oral presentation you have to do, and you're often so frightened of it, you pretend to be sick and get a doctor certificate. So therefore, no practice at all, right? And, and when you think do about practice, most... you imitate somebody else that you saw. Like so, yeah. like when do you get to find your own voice? That's right, and, and it, it's why one of the things I, I I teach a lot of my students, I say you have to be willing to break the mold. Mm -hmm. You know, we we all have a mold. We all have a mold, and and the mold that we have. I mean, I, I remember growing up, I, there was this girl I fancied. Uh, she, I was about twelve years old, and it was Stacy. And I, I remember asking my best friend Lenny because he was able to get all the girls, the lucky bastard. And I said, Lenny, how do you, how do you, how do you get there? How do you get her attention? And he said, he goes, magic. Oh, easy, man. Learn magic. No, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't give me that advice, damn it, because I probably would have been better at that. He goes, <laughs> oh, dude, it's easy. Just, just be funny. And that, oh, just be you know, funny. yeah, that's not easy. And I remember in class, I tried saying a joke, and not only did she not laugh, I remember her flicking her beautiful blonde hair over, looking me dead in the eyes, and saying. You're not funny. Stop trying to be like Lenny. 
<laughs> and I was like, no, you broke my little 12 year old heart. And but anyway, such sage advice. I'm sure that wasn't well, but, meant it, but <laughs> no, but what happened was she put me back in my mold, right? I, I tried to break out of my comfort zone to do something I wouldn't normally do. And then she put me back in my mold. So I, I stayed in my mold after that. I didn't dare tell another joke. And, and I, I, I moved schools four times. So every time I went to a new school, I had the opportunity to break out of my mold because people didn't have any preconceived ideas of who I was. Mm. So at one school, I became the bully, right? And then the bullies realized I wasn't a bully and beat the shit out of me. And then I went to another school and I became the entrepreneurial with him. So to me, I had multiple opportunities to break out of my mold. Whereas I find that a lot of my students, when they come to me, they have a mold. And it's because their work environment sees them as a certain way. Their, their family sees them as a certain way. And even worse, they see themselves as being a certain way. So I create a lot of experience where experiences where I force them to break out of that mold. And it's extremely excruciating to do it, but it's extremely thrilling on the other end. Because in order to learn how to use this instrument well, we do have to break out of our comfort zone and our molds. And once we break out of it, you start to realize, man, there's a, there's a whole world of, there's a whole world of music that I can play. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's terrifying though. I had, I had Mike Anino on the show a, a couple of weeks ago and you know, he, he, the first time I met him was, was at awesome. Rogue public speaking and he, he was teaching improv. And I, I was like, Mike, I have to tell you that the, the moment I met you, I hated you. I hated you because <laughs> I walked into this um, uh, mandatory class that we had to take and there were like a hundred people in the room and you were there and it was like a giant stage. And I remember thinking, great, there's a hundred people. I hate improv. I'm just going to hide in the back. And then you were like, everybody form a circle around me. So there was nowhere to hide. I'm like, and I hated you <laughs> from the moment. And doing that improv fundamentally changed the way that I get on stage now because I mm. feel so comfortable. I know that no matter what happens, I know how to, I know how to, I can handle, it. I know where to go, but it was getting, it was breaking that mold. It was, it was yeah. being forced to get uncomfortable and to, and to make mistakes and to feel stupid and to know that mm. it was, it was going to be fine. Right. Like that's, and that's, I think where, where the people who are in your class who have this great substance to back it up, that's where they're mm. always safe because they can rely on what they know best. Yeah, and, and I, I tell them all the time, uh, you, you have incredible music. If only you learned how to play it, you are the people who will change the world. You know, whereas I think there are, and I, I fundamentally believe this, it's why I, I, I want to dedicate my life to teaching this, and it, it's that these are the people that are going to change the world. I, I know my limitations. As much as I, you know, kind of believe in the philosophy of I can achieve anything I desire, I, I'm very aware of my aware of my limitations. I've become self-aware to that more so now than ever. And then I see the potential within my students. I'm like, you, you not only have the method of how to create this innovative thing in your industry, you know how to do it. And if only you were able to breathe life into that and sing it well, you're going to change the entire industry. So, so to me, it's so exciting as a teacher because every time they come, I'm going, wow, they're going to they're gonna go away singing these songs of greatness. But again, it's, it, there's a lot to overcome. It's, it's not just, oh, come along and you, you can sing beautiful songs. No, it, it takes work. It takes work. It takes dedication. And I've seen it happen now after teaching it for the last five or six years. I've seen the results of what happens. And it's, it's, it's really fulfilling. So I want to I, I wanna go back to something you just said about knowing your limitations, because I I think that's really interesting. Um, as somebody who <laughs> took a different path so many different times, who, you know, magic is magic because you imagine this thing in your mind until it becomes a reality, you know, in your fingertips. Uh, you created a career in speaking out of, you know, thin air, right? Like you made the shift from, you know, you have to be the good Asian son to becoming a magician. You made the shift from being a magician to a speaker when you were, I remember we've talked about this where, where you were first trying to get booked and people were like, no, 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 we don't, we, we'll hire a magician, yeah, but magician. we'll have you in the after dinner hour. And you're like, no, no, no I'm the keynote or I should be on stage. You know, we don't need a magician. Yeah. So like you've, you've reinvented mm. yourself so many times that limitations yeah. were never, I would imagine, in consideration. So to hear you say, like, I know my limitations, I've become self-aware of them in this last year. Is that, is that fatherhood? Is that the pandemic? Where, where does that, well, let's talk a little bit about, if you yeah. want to touch on any of the things that I just mentioned, and then I want to hear about limitations. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I 
my dad. I was in the US pursuing the speaking career and I actually became very unhappy. And I, I didn't I didn't really talk about it much because I just I just, you know, self-talk. You're like, dude, you should be grateful for this. Clients are paying to fly you all over the place. You know, shut up. Yeah, it's a and, ridiculous job. You get on a plane, somebody yeah, gives this ridiculous. huge check, you go home, and then you're exhausted yeah. with your wife and your young kid. Yep. And and so last year in November, I, I'm pretty sure I was depressed. Hmm. And I, I remember calling one of my friends and I go, dude, I don't know why I call you. I just feel shit. And I remember him going, whoa, I've never heard you sound like this. Uh, I'll, I'll fly over. I'll see, you, I'll see you Friday. I'm going to clear my diary. So it was Wednesday. He flew over from Australia and he spent two weeks with me and just kind of flew all around the US with me while I was doing the gigs because I couldn't stop doing the gigs. I, I was, you had I was, contracts. Yeah, sure. I had the contract. So, so he flew around in New York to Chicago. He flew around all over with me and he took two weeks off work and he's the CEO of a multi-million dollar business in Australia. So he's, he's a, mm. such a brilliant human. And he made me realize so much. I, I was shutting myself out because of that thought that you are so lucky to be able to do this. So with his help and one line from my father, uh, my father calls me and he goes, look, I've been thinking for about 12 months to come up with this one sentence to tell you. My, my father's a man of few words. And he says, a king that knows the limits to his desires will rule an entire lifetime. That's it. And, and I went, wow, I love medieval stuff and I love watching medieval stuff. And he goes, son, you've lost track of you, your desires. You've become too greedy. Hmm. You've lost track of it. And you'll become that king that tries to conquer and conquer and conquer. And as a result, lives a short life and has minimum, minimal influence. That one sentence made me decide to kind of stop speaking and come home. I didn't come back to Australia because of the pandemic. I came back to Australia because I wanted to come home. I wanted to stop. I, I didn't realize in my life, Laura, that success comes with sacrifice. I, I had this rosy view of success. I just looked at success as, oh, the more success you get, oh, the more amazing it is. I didn't realize that the more success you want, the more you have to sacrifice. And I, I'd gotten to the point where I'd sacrificed so much in my life for the success that I had. And I was no longer willing to sacrifice anymore. Uh, and that's why I, I, I say I, I know my limits, not because... I, I genuinely do believe we can be limitless. However, we also need to choose at some point where to also stop a journey and then begin another, you know? And, and, and to me, I don't know if I want to speak moving forward, you know? And, and I want to give myself the permission to be able to even say it and then decide it. And then the virus came along and then decided it for all of us. <laughs> When I ran that last company, we had a retreat and we had a, a, a facilitator come in, a Harvard Business School uh, professor, and she asked us all to go around and you know m name how many staff members we thought an ideal number of people would be for this team. And we had like 35 people at the time. And people were like, I don't know, 35, 62, 104, 512, 7. Like people were just making up numbers. And she got to me and I said, I think that's a terrible question. I, uh, what are we doing? Are we maximizing for profit? Are we maximizing for personal flexibility and freedom? Or are we maximizing for uh, uh, impact mm. in the world? And I'll give you two of the three. You could pick two of the three, but you can't have mm. all three. And and depending on what we want to maximize for, we're going to run a very different company. And so yeah. I love the 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 sentence from your father, uh, the a king that knows his limits. I mean, because that's really what it is, right? If you know what your limits are, or even what your desires are and then you go after those but not other ones because i think we live in this world where it's like bigger better faster more is the definition yeah. of success when maybe that's not yours you know i i interviewed jordan harbinger on the show a, a couple of months ago and you know he's got a hugely successful podcast and he's been asked repeatedly to grow it and build it and syndicate it and he's like you know we started going down that path and i looked at my wife and mm. i looked at my baby son and i was like you know, we started this in the first place so I could be around. So why do I want to mm. do this thing that takes me further away? And so it was sort of this, a similar idea that, um, you know, we, we, we think the only path of success is like continued and more and amplification when 
there's yeah. really this question of if you know what enough is, you could be really happy in that space. Well, there's that there's that brilliant kind of story where I can't remember which book I read it from, but uh, you know, this man goes to visit a, a man in his his home and is a billionaire. And he walks into the billionaire's home and he goes, there's one thing I'll have that the billionaire will never have. And that's enough. Yes. You know, and, and I think that, that's such a powerful little story when I read it because I went, wow. Yeah, I want to explore what is enough. And, but, but it's so hard when you grow up from an immigrant family and, and you, you grow up with scarcity and, and wealth creation becomes one of your core values in your life. You know, and, and it's so hard to step away and go, actually, I think I have enough. You know, I, one of the greatest things uh, a dear friend of mine taught me, and I don't know how I became his friend, but he, he was the creator of Suri, uh, Adam Cheya. And I, I sat on the train with him to work and I waited for him at work all day and then sat on the train with him home just about to converse with him. And he had this brilliant kind of philosophy for life. And, and he goes, life is, like a, life is like a book, right? And what makes a great book is many different chapters, chapters that almost have no relevance to the other. And, you know, he created Suri, then he went on to create Bixby and, and all these different things. And guess what he's pursuing now is he's pursuing becoming a professional magician, <laughs> you know, and, and it's incredible because he just goes, a, a well-lived life is a life with many different chapters. And the only way to write the next chapter is to end this one, to consciously end this one. And I found that so inspiring because I, I, I'm now going through the process in my head of ending certain chapters to be able to give myself permission and the room and the cognitive capacity to begin the new. When and, I sold that yeah. company, uh, I ran to people on the street. They were like, great, congratulations. Now what are you doing? And I would say, I don't know. Yeah, there's I'm beauty in that. Time to figure out. There's but beauty in were, that. People were so terrified mm. by that. They were like, oh, okay. And they would change the subject as soon as they could. And they'd like run the other direction because people mm. are so uncomfortable with the unknown like the unknown and the uncertain and the, you know, because like, you know, the immigrant family, the focus on wealth creation, the, the, the focus is on creation, not wealth, mm -hmm. right? Like if you just define like, this is what wealth is, you don't need to keep creating, creating, creating. But this idea that we never know what wealth is forces yeah. you to keep creating and you don't have this time, that cognitive space. Right. So like the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the ending something so you can start another is scary because like, it what is. if the other doesn't happen? But if you don't end this, the other will never happen. Yes. Right. And, th and then that's when monotony kicks in and you end up living a whole lifetime and you only have written one chapter and there's no variety, you know, and, and what you said before though, the unknown, but the unknown is where magic lives. Yes. The unknown is where wonder lives. You, you will never feel a sense of wonder if you never venture into the unknown. The only reason magic is wonderful, the only reason magic is astonishing is because you do not know how it's done. If you know how it's done, it's quite frankly pretty bland, right? It's, it's really pedestrian if you know how it's done. So magic lives in the unknown. Wonder lives in the unknown. And if you never venture into the unknown, you will never experience wonder. And wonder is frightening. And I think people don't talk about the other side of wonder. They often talk about that, oh, it's lovely fairies and unicorns but no it's 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 devilish it's hell the monsters aliens wonder you know, hell. Yeah. yeah there's wonder hell seriously i love this book cup like title so much <laughs> you i can't wait to read this it's going to be amazing so i you know so so here's so here's what's what's so neat about it like i I find now that I've studied speakers, that I watch speakers, that I understand what it's like to be on stage, I'll watch somebody get on stage, like, like a, a, a stand-up comedian or a magician mm. or somebody who's just up there, just them, and they're like holding a lot of quiet time, right? Like magicians and comedians, that's often when they're not speaking, that's like the most amazing time that's there. And I watch it and I'm like, God, it's, it's, it's so, you know how hard that is to do? That's so hard to yeah. do. And I like, I'll look at my husband, I'll be like, this is amazing. He's like, I know there's a pause. You tell me this every time. I'm like, I know, but it's so <laughs> cool. Like I just, every time I'm amazed by it. And, and the, the hardest thing for me was not speaking on stage. Like people are like, aren't you afraid to speak on stage? And I'm like, no, I'm terrified to be quiet on stage. Like that's the hardest mm. thing because that's the like, that's that scary unknown piece. So when you're talking to your students, how do you get them comfortable with that with that unknown? Like it's gonna be okay. And and because I think they're probably rushing to the like, I want to get through it. I want to get to the other side of it. I want to be comfortable. 
but how do you get them to just enjoy right the yeah. space because like the thing about wonder hell is it's amazing it's incredible it's wonderful that this thing is working and that it, you're seeing this potential and also it's exhausting and you're stressed and it's anxiety provoking and it's hell and everyone's like i want to read this book because i want to get through wonder hell and i'm like no the book is going to be about how do you actually enjoy this liminal space of being mm. in the wonder and being in the hell because each one of them builds the other how do you teach that to your students that probably come because they're like vin teach me the solution get me to the other side <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a that's a that's a very big question. Look, I uh, back to Mike, you know, our, our mutual friend as well, who teaches improv. Uh, improv changed my life. I, I I haven't spoken publicly about this many times, but I there's a quote in the World of Magic that revealed to me the importance of improv, which will answer the question you asked. And the quote in the World of Magic is: "A magician is an actor playing the part of a magician." So when I kind of read this, I was like, oh, okay, it's quite profound. I need to go learn some acting skills if I want to make the magic come across as being real. Yes. And so I started diving into improv. And I started to realize improv gave me a level of confidence that nothing in my life has given me that kind of confidence. And when I built the skill of improv, I had the ability to ebb and flow no matter what came my way. I no longer was afraid of situations like this where I don't know what question Laura could be asking me. <laughs> Whereas before, I, I, this would scare me shitless, right? Because I, I, what, what, what are they going to throw at me? Q&A? Oh, I don't want to do Q&A. But then when I learned the skill of improv, the skill of ebbing and flowing, I started to get a sense of confidence. And then that, that skill of ebbing and flowing on stage during a short form improv game then translated through into my life as an entrepreneur. I now was comfortable with the uncomfortable because I understand the philosophy behind it. So to me, if you looked at Vin at you know 10 improv classes versus Vin now, like I've done over probably 500 in my life, I'm a very different person. I'm an extremely different person because I'm now able to just ebb and flow no matter what you throw my way. Heck, even when I do a magic trick and it doesn't work on stage, before I learned improv, I remember this one moment, I just ran backstage, I didn't know what to do, and then the audience slow clapped me. Oh, it was no. a horrible experience, they were slow clapping me, and I, my mic was on, I was heavy breathing, and then I cried. Oh, and, no. and then I had the same one, the same trick failed on me in Las Vegas last year with Dell, one of my biggest clients. And then when the magic trick failed, because I built it up, I'm like, I know what the word you're thinking of, I've written it down, what's the word you're thinking of? I've written down a word, they go elephant, and I wrote down gorilla. <sighs> And then I, again, you take a big pause and, and all I said was, isn't this fascinating? This will make sense in 15 minutes. And I never went back to it. And, I <laughs> and, then, to the and then you decided to quit speaking. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I kept speaking, but, but, like, but then I, I just never went back to it. No one was the wiser. There were three people who came up to me afterwards and said, what did you write on the back of that? And I go, it's all a part of the show. And no one was the wiser. <laughs> No one was the wiser, right? So to me, I learned from improv that errors are only errors because you perceive them to be errors. Yes. Or it could be an error or it can become a part of the show. Yes. So to me, then I was like, oh, dude, that means the failure in my life that I'm experiencing right now, that could be seen as a failure or it can be seen as a stepping stone for what I'm going to do next. Yes. So to answer the question you're asking, which is how do you become more comfortable with the uncomfortable, do improv. Do improv. Improv is is so tremendous. And also, like, write better headlines for yourself, you know? Like, I've seen so many people walk in and they're like, well, you know, I know that I'm not as good as my boss at this, but let me give you some details. And I'm like, why would you do that? Like, you, they, they've invited mm. you in. You're already wearing the mantle of expertise until you take it off and hand it away. Like, just stop stop doing that it's just it's almost like it's not even what you yeah. say like what you like what what you need to be saying i'm like just stop doing the things you're doing and just say the thing it's it's crazy to me how we we sort of get in our own way because you know i had a staff member once who was like i'm just going to walk in and give them all the information so then they can't ask me any questions and i'm like yeah but you talked to them yeah. for 20 minutes they just stopped listening it wasn't there you didn't you haven't convinced them yeah we really it's, it's do a, a lot of things mm. It, well, we're human. We're naturally imperfect and in some ways beautifully imperfect, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what makes all of us so special. It makes us all so interesting. And so if people, that's my segue here. So if people want to figure out how to, you know, communicate their own freak flag and be more interesting, the person that they have inside. Um, I know people who are watching this on the video can see the scroll, but for those who are listening on the podcast, tell 
people where to find you and where to find this incredible virtual communications training that you do? Well, you can uh, follow me on social media at, at AskVin, A-S-K-V-I-N-H, or my workshop site is stageworkshop.live. So you can find me there. Perfect. Vin, thank you so much for getting up extra early in Australia no or being up extra late. I don't even know what time it is, but thank you. This was amazing. <laughs> um, magic internet. We love it. You're fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura. Thanks.